Hello and welcome to the Brave Business Podcast, brought to you by accounting, tax, audit and advisory firm Blick Rothenberg. Brave by name and brave by nature, this series is different. Aimed at entrepreneurial businesses, we focus on providing market updates, practical guidance, timely insights and professional opinions from industry experts, helping you make informed decisions for your business. I'm Declan Curry, journalist and broadcaster. In this episode, we look at the autumn budget. Who are the winners? Who are the losers? And with recession looming, what should your business do to get ready for it? Joining us to discuss all of this from Blick Rothenberg, it's Chief Executive Nime Shah, it's Corporate Tax Partner Heather Self, and our guest today, financial journalist Simon Gompertz. Welcome all three of you to the podcast. So the budget's happened. There's been acres of coverage in the newspapers, on television and radio. What are the most important bits for the listeners of this podcast, Nimesh? So the thing for me that didn't really get too much attention during the budget and even in the immediate aftermath was the energy price guarantee. We talked about it for domestic Uh, domestic households, but little was said about businesses. The original plan from Liz Truss was that businesses would get support until March, six months of support. But after that, nothing at all. And Jeremy Hunt was pretty silent on that. So it was actually what was not said about the energy price guarantee. Energy bills are going to go up for businesses as well as individuals. And that's important because for many businesses, that's one of their big cost uncertainties going into what is almost certain to be a recession. Yeah, it's got to be a cloud hanging over many businesses, that that uncertainty over what are their electricity and gas bills going to look like come March. Heather, what stood out for you? I think it's got to be the rate of corporation tax. It's been up and down like a yo-yo in various budgets and statements. We're now sure that it is going to go up to 25%. That's the highest rate for about 10 years or so. Although for businesses with less than £250,000 in profits, and that's across the whole group, not per company, it will stay at 19%. But for a lot of businesses, quite a significant rise in corporation tax. And Simon Gompertz, I have to say how lovely it is to see you again. Lovely to see you, Declan. Uh, for, the, for those of you who don't know, Simon and I worked together on many BBC programmes for about 150 years between us. So and you've grilled me many <laughs> times before. From this budget, what stood out? I think what you have to think about is that this was a money-raising budget. And uh, to the tune of £55 billion over the next few years. So for small businesses, but also for individuals, personal tax, um, you really are going to need a very large microscope to see the benefits for you. You're likely to be losing out, but there are some things that haven't changed, and that's quite good news for some businesses. And that's an important thing to keep in mind for the for the listeners to this podcast who are people that run a business. They're also going to be worrying about their own tax position as well after all of this. They, they see both sides of the ledger. Their own, their own tax, tax position, position, but also the outlook for the economy, obviously, and the outlook outlook for individuals, whether they'll spend more, whether they'll want more. Uh, I think people are going to be concerned about the next year or so. Okay, let's work through a checklist of things that are going to be important to the listeners to this podcast. As they run their businesses, they're thinking about uh, what investments they should make in the year ahead. What's happened to the tax position on that? This is one of the rare bits of good news. If a business spends money on plant and machinery, up to a certain limit, they can get a full write-off of that cost in year one. That limit has been 200000 for a while. It's been up and down again, like other things. It, they go up and they come back down again. But we have now got a commitment to that being a million pounds for the foreseeable future. And for most small businesses, that's going to mean anything they can afford to spend on new plant and equipment, they can write off immediately against tax. And of course, if their profits are high enough, get relief at 25%. And that million pound figure for any moderately sized owner managed business, that's generous enough, isn't it? That is, yes. That's going to cover something like 90% of all companies, I think. However, as always, there's a sting in the tail. We were promised some investment zones. They're going to be scaled back, although we don't have the full details yet. And also research and development expenditure. At the moment, smaller businesses get much more generous R&D relief than large businesses. That's going to be scaled back quite significantly. And apparently it's in response to concerns about fraud and claims being made which shouldn't qualify 
but it does seem to be a rather large hammer to crack a nut. And I think that's really discouraging. We want small businesses to be innovative, to develop new technology and hopefully grow into big businesses. Yes, I thought that was a bit snotty at the time, the suggestion, you know, the, this broad brush approach to small business. Oh, you're all fraudsters. We have seen aggressive selling of companies that specialise in coming up with R&D claims. I've got a client who runs restaurants. They had someone approach them and say, we can get you R&D relief on your new recipes. No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so there is a little grain behind it. There was a lot of press attention in the run-up to the autumn budget about R&D. Big article in The Times just the week before about the amount of fraud that was taking place in that sector. It just felt like a little bit uh, rushed from the government to do something around R&D when we really didn't need to. It seemed a bit foolish to me. So one other thing that's worth talking about that's on the good side, I suppose, that businesses will be relieved about is to do with employment costs. Because, you know, you're still going to be celebrating the fact that the one and a quarter percent um, increase in national insurance um, was cancelled and it cancelled uh, this month and that's carrying on so that's great news but um, national insurance is a very complicated uh, beast and s snuck into this budget which is full of stealth operations was a freezing of the threshold at which you'll start paying national insurance on your employee and over the, as time goes by you know, that's going to increase costs for businesses. And I'll just add one more thing in there, um, which is uh, th the living wage, the national minimum living wage. Um, great that it's gone up. It's another employment cost, though. So that's at uh, £10.42 an hour. And it's something that businesses are going to be thinking about. Just sticking with that national insurance, yes, it's good news for this year. But the amounts that this freezing of the national insurance level is going to bring in in the next couple of years are going to be over £3 billion in the next year. And then rising to almost six billion by 2027, 20, 28. So that's really quite a significant levy on businesses. But as you say, it's very much a stealth tax. You won't notice that you're paying a higher percentage. It's sneaky, year. sneaky, sneaky. That freezing of thresholds that never to, well, to anyone in the real world feels like a tax rise. But Simon, that is what it is. Uh, we were promised that uh, all the main taxes would, wouldn't go up. But, of course, this is a way of raising tax. It's a sort of broken promise because we're going to have to pay more, both individuals and businesses. And worth remembering that the Conservative manifesto in 2019 said it wouldn't increase income tax, national insurance and VAT. It did actually increase national insurance, but only for six months. They did break that tax triple lock. Arguably, though, the freezing of all these allowances is a is a more severe mechanism for the government to raise taxes. Actually, if you just increased the headline rate of income tax, it would have raised less than what the freezing of the allowances would have done. And then, of course, you miss that other big tax that hardly anyone outside of accountancy understands, capital gains. Yeah, there was a big threat, as there is with every budget that I see these years, that capital gains tax is going to increase. There's a big flurry of activity. I get lots of calls from clients saying, Nimesh, is capital gains tax going to go up? I've got no idea. Uh, the, the best person that will know will be the Chancellor. Even they have changed their mind in recent budgets. We thought something might happen at this budget. There was an opportunity, I thought, from Jeremy Hunt to say, I will increase capital gains tax, possibly even align it to income tax at 45% and maybe pre-announce that, maybe not for next year, but even the year after to April 2024, with a view to then maybe scaling it back. That wasn't mentioned, didn't happen. I think it's probably safe to say that capital gains tax won't go up now for the remainder of this parliament. What he did do was, though, he cut the capital gains annual exemption it was £12,300. It's going down to £3,000 from April 2024, and it's going to go down to £6,000 from next year. So people who people who are in the fortunate position to have made a profit on the sale of, what does it cover, the sale of uh, of, of, of shares? Yeah, yeah. With, within a business, where do you pay capital gains tax? Well, within a business, no, but within a... Um, if you're a if you're a business owner, someone who's selling their business, they will pay capital gains tax ten percent on the first million, twenty percent thereafter. That twenty percent is a really generous rate. The cutting of the allowance though from twelve thousand three hundred to three thousand doesn't really touch the sides when you're selling your business for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pounds. So that's not going to make too much of a dent. What business owners are really worried about was is that rate going to go up? And as I say, I think it's um, here to stay for the remainder of this parliament. And he's gathering more tax on the dividends yes. that companies pay. And for many small business owners, that's a big part of their income. 
particularly for the very smallest business owners and self-employed um, who really do rely on uh, pulling in dividends uh, if they if they have a, a limited company um, a, as a way of of, of um, avoiding tax, I suppose, but getting more money in. And what's happened is that the £2,000 allowance is going to be reduced to 1000 next year and I think 500 the the year after. So it's going to dwindle to virtually nothing. That, that's the amount you were able to get without paying any dividends. That's right. The rate of tax right. remains the same as with capital gains tax. And I think where Nimesh was talking about um, these things are less important if you're, say, selling a very large business or you've got a large amount of profit coming into your business. If you're quite a small player, particularly the dividend point is quite important and you might be relying on that. Just take a few thousand pounds out of the company every year and that's going to you'll be paying more tax on that now. Uh, that alliance has only been around for, what, six years or so, isn't it? And it, it's, it's practically withering in front of our eyes. Well, it started at £5,000 when we had the reform of dividend taxation in 2016. I think more importantly for me, though, dividend tax rates have gone up during that period. Forget the dividend allowance. It's £5,000 or it was £5,000. But dividend tax rates have gone up by 10% during that period. And if you're a top rate taxpayer now, the effective rate of tax when you combine corporation tax and the top rate of dividend tax of 39.35%, crunch those numbers through, you're at an effective rate of tax of almost 55%. It's cheaper to take money out as a salary with the national insurance than it is out of dividends. So that's a common misconception. Um, but certainly when you crunch the numbers, it could be more expensive in, in lots of cases that dividends uh, will cost you more. I think Nimesh is probably right that the Chancellor doesn't have a great deal of time left to, to revisit these things. So it's really next year and then we're looking at an election. And so, you know, will he, will he align capital gains tax rates with income tax or, or dividend tax rates to go up as well? He's probably had his shot at that now. But I think businesses will still be quite uncertain about it. You know, the doubts have been raised. Um, he's had a pop now. He might have another pop at them sometime in the future, even if it's not next year. I think it'll cause a bit of uncertainty. Capital gain tax against tax isn't really something you can put on the side of a bus, is it, to to try and win an election? It's not, it's not worth very much. Uh, it was record receipts this year, 15 billion. It's tiny in the total tax take. And I think he got away with not having to raise it this time round. I think a lot of traditional Conservative voters would have been very upset had he aligned it to income taxes. And as I say, for business... That, sorry, that would have meant an increase in the rate, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it would have doubled the rate, and well, more than doubled the rate. So it's good news. And in a way, business owners who are looking to sell their business over the next few years, they were the biggest winners from this budget. Uh, speaking of winners, are there any others? Heather's pointed to this already, um, but it's in, if you're looking at corporation tax, you know... Most people affected by what we're talking about today, small businesses, will be paying 19%. And that stayed. And I would feel a winner there because there's been a lot of talk about 25%. What's going to happen in future? At least I know now that I'm only going to be paying 25%. Um, if my uh, profits, as I understand it, are less than 250000 a year. So that's a huge number of small businesses. Are there any businesses that should change their behaviour because of anything that was in the autumn budget. Was there anything really lucrative to go after? Is there anything that now needs to stop because it's not as generous as it was? I would say if they need to upgrade their computer systems, this would be a great time to spend money on that because you'll get 100% allowances on it and then you're in a good position to benefit from perhaps being more efficient in your sales processes, your invoice processing, your security being protected against cyber attacks and so on. So a good time to spend on IT equipment. If you're a seller of IT equipment, a good time to go out selling it to small businesses. I think the challenge that the government are facing here with that £1 million in annual investment allowance is are businesses going to be confident enough to actually spend that money? The R word has been mentioned so many times. There's some economic commentators out there, maybe I'm one of them as well, that's saying, did the budget that we've just had actually prolong that recession? It may not be as deep, but has it made it longer? And so our business is just thinking, that's great, I've got a million pounds, but do I really want to spend it right now? Has it made it longer? In my view, I think it has. Uh, I think... Uh, we, you know, we all took a very deep breath and a long pause just now. Are there any winners? 
Jeremy Hunt said, I'm not going to pull any rabbits out of the hat. So there's no real good news or nothing to latch on to say these, this is an opportunity for a business or an individual in terms of what this budget had to say. So I, I think the government has made a position around the next six months to say, let's wait and see what will happen globally around energy prices and the war in Ukraine. And then we may show our hand again in the run-up to the next election about them potentially giving some, some giveaways back into the system. Entirely agree with Nimesh. And I think consumer confidence generally is still very low. People are really worried. Anyone who's on a fixed rate mortgage that's going to come to an end in the next few months is going to see a major increase in their outgoings. So people are going to be spending less on discretionary things, more on the essentials, but less on anything that they can cut back on. I totally agree. Not many winners, but there are things that you could be doing. And Heather, you talked about making sure you take advantage of your uh, annual investment allowances at the moment. Obviously, uh, if you're going to be hard pressed in the coming recession, that's what we're getting. You you want to take advantage of all of that. But I think we have a sort of deadline coming up now uh, in April where some um, rates and allowances are going to change. And um, we're also going to see at that point more people moving into either um, the 20% 20% tax bracket, starting to tax, pay tax for the first time, this is on their personal tax, or into 40 or 45%. And that means it's going to be an important time to start thinking, how can I perhaps not go into that rate by uh, making bigger pension contributions uh, and saying, you know, I can avoid the tax that way. Um, or if you're reasonably well off and you've got money to give away, saying I can give some money to charity now, and that means I won't go into the uh, 40% or, or 45% rate. So take advantage of those things before the rules change in April. You'll know your clients. Do they look at the tax thresholds or the uh, the freezing of the thresholds and do some of them say, you know, I'm not going to try as hard next year, I'm not going to work as hard next year. What's the point? I think the sentiment of, I think Heather summed it up before, that people are concerned about having to pay more tax, uh, having to also face higher living costs as well. Um, is there still the sentiment around, well, is it worth it? And Well, I think it is. Uh, there's still an aspiration to get to earning more money, uh, if at least just to pay for the costs of, um, of, of running your life these days as well. Uh, I don't think it's going to in any way dampen the spirit of British enthusiasm, British entrepreneurship. Uh, what I think it does do is just make it just that bit more difficult as well. And it's such an about turn from what we had in the end of September. The failed, the ill-fated mini budget of Kwasi Kwarteng, uh, where we are now, it was the 100 billion swing. Simon, you mentioned before it was 55 billion. Well, if you add up what was given away in the mini budget and add it together with what we've just seen, that's a huge sum of money that people are having to cough up in extra tax. And that's got to have some kind of impact. But I still firmly believe that I don't think it will necessarily dampen the enthusiasm. The quasi Kwarteng mini-budget was all about plans for growth and this one feels to be more about stability and reassurance. Have we stopped talking about growth? Uh, Jeremy Hunt mentioned it a lot during uh, the autumn budget statement. Uh, I think right now it is a six-month play. Uh, They need to stabilise. I mean, he, he used the word stability in his opening remarks. He doesn't want to go away from growth. We do need to get back on that growth agenda. Uh, Businesses want to see that certainty as well. Uh, It's so uncertain over the next few months. But I think Jeremy Hunt is relying on that, that we'll we'll ride through the global situation. We've got that opportunity, that window right now. And then we'll play our hand, hopefully, at the budget next year to see what may happen. You're expecting a lot in this budget next year. (laughs) Well, doesn't fate tell you that, Declan, that uh, it's coming up to election season? So it's, it's more giveaway than tightening in, in the years ahead. Is that what we, what we think? I've been watching budgets for a very long time and chancellors almost always find a few rabbits just before an election. But so much has been left to chance now and um, we don't know what's going to happen next year. It's a very, very difficult outlook for the government. And yes, um, there's a scenario where they have a budget in the autumn of next year, they introduce a tax cut. We know that we know that uh, Rishi Sunak has talked about uh, a penny off the basic rate of tax, so taking it down to 19%. So he's he's nailed his colours to the mast. Uh, wouldn't it be good to do that then, so that people then have the money in their pockets when the cut comes into play the following April, and then you have an election after that. But you know, at the moment, life isn't happening in in such easy steps, is it? We have the 
war in Ukraine. We have the possibility of the recession over the next year. And, you know, I think small businesses are going to be worried. They're going to be um, pulling their belts in, aren't they, over that time? Very concerned. Is that what owner-managed businesses should be doing to prepare for the recession? So it's been a fairly gloomy podcast so far. Not many winners that we've talked about. For businesses, we've talked a lot about the uncertainty factor. And I think businesses will react to that, Declan, that they will not want to maybe deploy capital over the next six month period. The government are also probably expecting that as well with the Jeremy Hunt budget that we've just seen, that businesses will want to ride out what the uh, the economic agenda looks like. And so for me, businesses just taking a bit more of a cautious approach, understanding what that macroeconomic environment may look like for them. And then we may see some good news coming out from the budget, uh, from uh, from the government in the next spring statement as well. The government are also putting their chips on the fact that the global situation will improve. Let's see what happens with the war in Ukraine. Will that somehow come to a dramatic a dramatic end? China's zero COVID policy, which has such a big impact on the supply chain as well. And what does all of that mean for... Uh, the energy price, the global energy price as well, which the government keep pointing their fingers towards. I think as well, going going back though to uh, the actual budget measures themselves that we had from uh, the Chancellor just now, um, and we heard the CBI questioning it afterwards saying, you know, where's the growth effectively? You know, we want growth, but what measures here are actually going to promote growth? And this is the problem over the next year when we know we're likely to have a recession. We know that small businesses are contending with maybe not super high interest rates, but higher interest rates. If they've got um, high debts, they'll be feeling a little bit vulnerable over this time. You know, what are the measures that are going to pu- pull us through that uh, that period? Not entirely clear. The budget... We've talked a lot about tax and allowances and incentives there. And I agree that there wasn't much there that would really stimulate and encourage that growth agenda. But when I speak to businesses right now, the biggest concern is labour shortage. And not only do we have a war in Ukraine, global energy price and all time high, also the UK has decided that it would have Brexit, which has made that labour shortage effect more compounded. So... Will the government then show their hand outside of a fiscal event around what they're looking to do to address that labour shortage issue? Because I think that would unlock some of the growth potential that we've got. Businesses are talking about if we had more people, we could do a lot more. I think there was also a recommitment to some of the big infrastructure projects. As somebody who actually lives in the northwest, I was delighted that we have got the recommitment to HS2. Now, that's very big government spend, but there is a trickle-down effect. There's big contractors, there's subcontractors, and it comes right down to smaller businesses doing all sorts of engineering and construction work on those big infrastructure projects. So that, I think, is something which, if those had been cancelled, that would have been a much bigger dampener on growth. And a bit of money for East West Rail It'd might be, nice be welcome, too. but that could be a whole other podcast if we ever got round to that. In a year, we've had three prime ministers, we've had four chancellors, there's still time before Christmas to squeeze in another chancellor if we uh, wish to do so. Is there is there an element of whiplash in business? Does business look at government and think, for pity's sake, Get your act together. We're done with this level of chaos now. We need a bit of stability to make some plans. Yeah, businesses, I think we've talked about on previous episodes of this podcast, businesses like certainty. It may not necessarily be good news, but they want to know what the system will look like. And that's just not what they've had. Okay, we've had COVID hanging over us as well, which was a big cataclysmic event something unprecedented that no one had faced before. The government reacted really quickly uh, and they should be praised actually for their speed and the the scale of the policies that they introduced at that time. But it was still that yo-yo effect that Heather talks about around fiscal events that we've had. And uh, we were talking about it before that um, businesses haven't been able to get that stability because we've not had that long-term strategic budget in the lifetime of this parliament. And to be fair to this government, they haven't really had that opportunity to do that. And I think Rishi uh, Rishi Sunak in his time as chancellor, he wanted to be that transformational chancellor. He just didn't get the opportunity. So um, I do hold some sympathy for the government around what they've had to do. It's been been very reactive. Maybe Jeremy Hunt has set a tone right now that this is what we'll do for the short term over the next six months to ride out that that global situation. 
and then we can think about that longer term plan. The worry, I suppose, that this government will have is an election's coming up. And so what does that mean for stability? What does that mean for businesses as well? Businesses don't really like elections um, because it does create that uncertainty again. The two of them, Rishi Sunak and, and Hunt, are sort of forced together, aren't they now? And so to an extent, the uncertainty continues. How long will this double act carry on? They have to stay together now because of the fears that it will unsettle uh, the country. But as you say, we've had so many um, chances and prime ministers. Um, you know, if I was running a business, I'd be thinking, oh, what next with these people? Well, will they have an argument and, and Hunt will be gone before the next election? Because that may well be what Sunak wants. It's, he's, he's not Sunak's natural uh, chancellor. So I think the uncertainty remains. And, you know, we know that this was a budget where businesses ended up paying more tax. And uh, so that's going to make people uncertain as well. And I don't know what you two think, but the very much the smaller or in the middle uh, business owner manner is going to manage is going to feel well i'm paying i'm i'm taking most of the burden you know compared to maybe a larger business it's interesting that Sunak persuaded Jeremy Hunt to delay the budget slightly because he wanted to get under the skin of the numbers. To me, Sunak still feels like a finance director and not a chief exec. He's not showing that strategic vision for where this government is going. Also, the original budget would have been on Halloween as well, and they really wanted to avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's worth saying that, you know, a lot of the uncertainty is not to do with the, with the budget. You know, we, we do live in a very uncertain world, and it's unfair to blame everything um, on, on Jeremy Hunt and, and the government. What's going to happen in the Ukraine? And that will dictate uh, to a great measure what's going to happen next year to, the, to company and business finances. We've also talked a lot about the tax side of the budget, but we haven't talked about the, the spending cuts that are promised. And it's all very much going to be in the, the back end of his five year plan after the election, funnily enough. But the size of the spending cuts that are envisaged in this budget are huge. And we've had austerity for a long time. We've had a lot of freezes on pay. We're, we're starting to see a lot of industrial unrest across a number of sectors. There's a really big uh, problem coming over the horizon there if they try to force these spending cuts through. Are their fingers crossed? Are they hoping that if there's a rebound in growth, they may not have to go through with that level of austerity again? I think I could write the beginning of the next budget speech now. <laughs> I'm pleased to announce that we're starting to see the green shoots of recovery thanks to the careful measures we took in our last budget. And therefore, I can give away a little bit more than I had thought. Nima Shah, Heather Self and Simon Gompertz, thank you so much for sharing your insights and for a lively discussion. If you'd like further insights on the autumn budget, please visit www.blickrothenberg.com slash budget. Or for further guidance for owner-managed business owners, visit www.blickrothenberg.com slash entrepreneurs. I'm Declan Curry. This has been the Blick Rothenberg Brave Business Podcast. Thank you so much for your attention and for being part of our conversation. Music